but are there a certain set of issues that are just considered to be off limits? Of course, yeah. yeah. I mean, we all for a while, yeah. for a while. For a while, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so absolutely. I mean, it, and it is, uh, it, it, again, this is the first time that I realized how serious it was. I mean, probably it, it happened little by little within a period of, I don't know, 20, 30 years. But uh, it became more and more obvious in the last six or seven years to me. And uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I must say, to me, it's like a deja vu. I mean, I've, I've seen that, right? I mean, I've seen that kind of fear that people have to express opinions. I was born in Romania, and uh, so I was educated in a communist country. Romania was, was part of the communist system in Europe. Uh, under the influence of Soviet Union, uh, so the school meant indoctrination. There was an official reality of what you hear constantly being told on TV, radio, all the possible propaganda yeah. institutions and so on, and all, you know, all the wonderful things that are happening in society and, you know, the, what Ceausescu has yeah, been doing yeah, yeah, yeah. and what a great man he is. and you Collective know, utopia, he's, he's building for the Romanian he's, proletariat. He's, yeah, exactly, yeah, and, yeah. and you know, all, all the great yeah. things that are constantly happening and so on. So. Green productions so, at an all-time high, it's going great. And then, <laughs> then, you, then you talk about the, the private reality of people, when, when people talk among themselves and they, they express exactly the opposite opinions, right? I mean, uh, you know, how terrible <laughs> it is. It's, it's this totally totally schizophrenic sense that there are two different realities and and they they almost never intersect each other because if you if you try to express a, a, a real opinion that the one that you express to your friends if you want to express it in in public you get into huge trouble the party had its representative in everything right i mean a little bit like what's happening with dei today right you see dei uh in just about any office of the university, in just about any part of the university, you right. see now a penetration of diversity, equity, and inclusion. That has become a little bit like uh, what uh, party functionaries were supposed to to do. They were <laughs> everywhere, right? I mean, every every organization, no matter how small, it had to have somebody who was representing the party, and usually those people would be activists who are not interested in 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 educations or research or whatever they were supposed to do uh, but they were activists they were representing the interests of the party right. and they were the ones who had the power of course you you have now administrators who do nothing else. i mean they spend most of their time in diversity equity and inclusion so what is a plus that this is given to to university life i don't know I mean, I am, of course, I'm extremely worried about it. Do the administrators that occupy this vast octopus of ever, ever multiplying DEI administrative committees, do they know better than to like email you and try to like bully you into this DEI stuff? Or do they, are you personally ever subjected to their there was... erotic ill-informed requests? There, there was, there was one. The, the only thing that I can think of, but again, I mean, this was not for me in particular. This was sort of the policy of the university, is to have uh, everybody goes through a training course on on yeah. on, on sexual. Uh, what do you call it? I forgot the sexual education. I mean, it, <laughs> things that have to do with harassment, sexual harassment, right? A sexual harassment course. So uh, uh, and. Uh, I said no. I, I actually wrote even a letter to the dean or to the president saying that, you know, this reminds me... I mean, I'm triggered. In fact, I even used it, this word and yeah. it's true. I mean... You're traumatized. From I'm traumatized. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm traumatized. I mean, this idea of participating into this kind of, this kind of uh, mandatory courses where you, you have to learn certain things, I find it insulting. Once you don't have a clear signal of what it means to be meritorious, then uh, this 
automatically leads to corruption. I mean, that's what happened, of course, in Romania and in communist countries. It became incredibly, incredibly corrupt. I mean, this, all these things can be faked, right? I mean, for example, uh, you, you can fake uh, social activity, social justice activity. You can easily fake, right? Right. I mean, uh, it, And in your realm, it's kind of like you either can do the math proof or you can't. There's like a purity to it in terms of yes. merit and achievement. Yes, right? so, certainly. It cuts through the bullshit. You can't pay. You can't pay a guidance counselor to write your your admissions essay. It's just correct. But there is another you know. there is another aspect of it which I, I, I think people don't talk enough about it, which is that um, uh, suppose you 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 are a very bright uh, minority kid, right? So you you come from a school where, unfortunately, for whatever reasons, you don't you didn't get a very good education, but you are very bright and you really have aspirations and enthusiasm and you come, you are accepted at Princeton even though in principle you don't have the credentials for Princeton or I don't know, Harvard or Yale or whatever. Uh, and, and then you say, I want to do mathematics, let's say, right? Uh, or I want to do engineering. And, and well, in, in, I, I can tell you, it's easier for me to talk about mathematics because I know, I know the situation better. So su suppose this kid goes to, uh, comes to Princeton with the idea that he or she is going to pursue a career in mathematics. And then uh, they realize that they don't just don't have the background, right? Yeah. And they have to compete with kids which are about, I don't know, five or six. They come from international Olympiads, from China, from Taiwan, from, from uh, Pakistan, from Iran, from, right? So, you know, they compete with people who are five, six, seven years ahead of them in terms wow. of... And uh, I mean, what what do you think is going to happen? I mean, they are going to lose. They are going to lose. Uh, they are going to, to feel dejected. They are going to feel depressed. They feel they have no chance. And uh, in the end, they give up. And instead, they pick up other subjects, which are kind of soft subjects. You're when getting they... dangerously close to saying mismatch theory, which I I you, I have heard is radioactive to mention in any capacity at well, a university. I, I... I will mention it. I, I'm, I'm not afraid to mention it. I, I think it's, I think it's true. Yeah. But that's why I, I would say it because I think it's a disservice to them, to be uh, put in the position to have to co compete in in situations where they just simply don't have the the, the background uh, to do well, and uh, you uh, you prepare them for failure, more or less. I mean, you make them fail. I mean, the American university system until, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago was really a marvel of the world. One of the, the big, the, the most uh, impressive things that the United States has to offer, right? I mean, it's a very, it's a, it's unheard of. I mean, think of it from a historical point of view. I mean, it's unheard of that somebody like me coming from Romanian country, you know, from Romania, far away, having no absolutely no contacts here in the United States, that will will actually become a professor at Princeton. And, and of course, me, I'm just an example of among many, many people like this, yeah. right? They come from, I don't know, Pakistan or Iran or, or China or... And they, they succeed beyond any possible expectation. I don't think, you, you know, I challenge you to find any place, any time in history when that happened. Yeah. Right? When, when people from all over the world had these incredible opportunities to actually succeed in the United States. Let's say, take the universities in 1990, Princeton University. It was extremely, it was probably the mark, it was already extremely diverse in, in terms of real diversity. The real diversity based on merit, right? Judged. So, in terms of, of of what traditionally we understood opportunity meant, equal opportunity means allowing people, the best people from no no wherever they come from, to to uh, have a chance to come to Princeton or have a chance to come to Harvard, Yale, and so on and so forth. So, I think that that that, that was. The universities in, in the 1990s was perfectly, it was almost closest you can think of, of that kind of standard. And uh, ever since, I think it's deteriorated. And, uh, you know, what does it mean? Okay, so you, you say, you, you give a, a better chance to a certain group, but obviously you are going to take from another group that maybe has a, 
at the level of uh, individual merit, uh, it, it, it will mean that, uh, that certain, I don't know, Asian American who has perfect SAT scores and has perfect uh, credentials will not, will not be accepted to Princeton because somebody else has to come to take that position based on color or based on the racial group or based on any other kind of preference that uh, the university deems as being important. Uh, and your point is that necessarily makes the academic enterprise more mediocre. So in your makes, field... And corrupt, and right. corrupt. I mean, it's very easy. If you don't have standards, it's very easy to corrupt uh, uh, lack of standards.